Hello Chem 30 students. So today we are looking at um, some different types of organic reactions. So we're going to divide the organic reactions into three parts. So today we'll be looking at the first um, kind of group of types of reactions. But just before we get into that, I just wanted to give you guys a little reminder that at the end of the last section, I do have a little bit of a <clears throat> guide to decoding organic compound names. So um, just some of this is information that we looked at in our naming that we've covered in the last um, six or seven lessons, but um, some of it is different information because this was just an infographic that was available on a on a like chemistry news website that I use a lot. So some of it is useful. You can have a look through it. Some of it not so much. Like for example, we didn't look at aldehydes, ketones, or amines actually. Um, but this does still give you a little bit of a description of functional groups and gives you an example of alcohol, which we know. Um, it talks a little bit about the different type of um, bond types. So alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, um, which we did talk about. And <clears throat> All of the prefixes that we have for the number of carbons, a little bit of information about side chains and how they're located. Um, stereoisomerism, the only thing we talked about here is cis and trans, which they've labeled as E and Z. Um, so oftentimes we see different types of naming in chemistry depending on who you're talking to, which is why um, sometimes things can be a little bit tricky. Uh, we did not look at optical isomerism because that's um, dealing with like Vesper structures, so you don't have to worry about that, but if you're interested in it, of course you can have a look at that. So today we're looking at combustion and incomplete combustion. Combustion you still know from um, like Science 10 and Chem 20. Incomplete combustion is just a little bit of a slight difference on combustion. And then we're also going to look at different types of cracking and reforming. So in terms of curricular outcomes, um, you need to be able to define these different types of reactions and give kind of like some basic examples. Now, the only ones that you need to do that for out of what we're going to look at today are combustion reactions. Okay, um, so that would be looking at the examples. The addition, substitution, elimination, and esterification we're going to look at a little bit later on. The main thing with combustion, cracking, and reforming that you need to know is just like the general um, applications that they're used for, which is basically all for the petrochemical um, industry. Then you also be able need to be able to predict products and write and interpret balanced equations for all of those types of reactions. So again, that's going to be, you're only going to have to be able to write balanced equations for combustion out of the ones we look at today. The other ones you look we look at, you just need to know kind of the general idea of what happens in them. <clears throat> So cracking, just like the name implies, when we crack something, we break it apart right into smaller parts. And that's exactly what we're doing with the organic reaction of cracking. So it's a process that breaks long chained hydrocarbons into smaller molecules. Um, so it's kind of similar to what we would have learned as a decomposition reaction in um, like science 10 and chem 20. The only difference is that instead of, for most of those we were using like ionic compounds that were quite simple to break apart um, into like just two separate components. Whereas with this, we're looking at larger molecules and breaking them into smaller molecules. So it's um, a little bit, um, trickier to predict. And like I said, you guys don't have to be able to predict the products for this type of a reaction. Um, just the general idea of what's happening in the process. So in order to speed up this process of breaking these molecules into smaller molecules, catalysts are used and high temperatures. Um, we see high temperatures used a lot in order to speed up reactions. And remember the reason for that is kinetic molecular theory, right? So as you heat things up, the molecules move around more, they have more kinetic energy, which means that they're bumping into each other more often and with more um, energy. So that makes it more possible for them to overcome the bonds that they currently have to be broken and reform new bonds. Um, also catalysts are things that can speed up a reaction. We're going to look a little bit more in detail at those in unit D, but remember they are not used up themselves in the reaction. Okay, 
So in order for cracking to happen, sometimes you need to add hydrogen because basically what you're trying to do is if you're trying to take a larger hydrocarbon and you want to break it into smaller ones, there needs to be kind of like motivation for the carbons to break their bonds. And one of the things that can do that is to provide hydrogen to take the places on those open bonds um, after they're separated. Okay, so here you can see example of octane, larger eight carbon chain being broken down into hexane, a six carbon chain, and ethene. So the two carbons that got broken off of the octane here have um, had hydrogens come in and replace their empty spots and then also a double bond. And then basically we use this to create different types of desired hydrocarbons that can be used for whatever it might be. So in this case, hexane is used for fuel and ethene is used to make plastics. All right. So more in detail of like the applications of this, cracking reactions are used to increase the yield of gasoline from petroleum. So remember that when um, petroleum is taken from, you know, however it's extracted from the earth, we want to extract different um, compounds from there that are useful for us. So cracking reactions can be used to increase um, gasoline, which is smaller molecules, usually um, like isooctane is an example, so kind of like 8-carbon. There's also uh, butane and 3-ethyltoluene is another common compound in gasoline, which is like a benzene ring with an ethyl and a methyl group. Um, so all smaller kind of compounds versus the petroleum that's pulled from the ground is usually larger molecules, like up to 12-carbon molecules. Um, and even bigger. So basically from these smaller molecules that we are able to gain from the petroleum by cracking ap applications, we can use those smaller compounds to create fuel. Fuel is usually um, a range of simple hydrocarbons ranging from pentane to octane. Um, octane is highly desirable because it reduces something called knocking in engines, um, which we'll look at a little bit later on in this lesson. Um, plastics also, like we saw on the previous page there with the ethene, plastics are usually made out of small hydrocarbons like ethene that are combined to make long chains that repeat of that particular hydrocarbon. So we'll look at how, how those smaller molecules are linked to make desirable longer um, molecules later on. In terms of cracking, there's three main ways that it's done. So there's thermal cracking used to be used. Um, it was it required really high temperature and pressure. So anytime that you have to create these kind of like fairly hostile conditions, it's not the best because it's energetically demanding um, and also, you know, it can be inefficient. The thermal cracking was also messy and wasteful because it ended up having a lot of um, incomplete combustion happening in it, which produced large volumes of um, carbon left over that was really messy. Um, if you've ever worked with like just carbon, even in like um, in like printers and stuff like that, you know that it's it can be really messy. So this was basically eliminated by 1937 and then catalytic cracking and hydro cracking kind of replaced that in terms of what we do in order to to crack different molecules. Catalytic cracking is used mostly to create gasoline and natural gas. Um, so gasoline, which is like what we use in our cars, and natural gas, which is more like what we use um, to heat our homes and for appliances and stuff like that. So in catalytic cracking, pretty obvious from the name, we use a catalyst to speed up the reaction, and we don't need the reaction conditions that are as severe as the thermal cracking. So you end up with less residual, undesirable um, products like tar and asphalt and coke. In terms of hydro cracking, this is a diff little bit of a different process. It's a combination of catalytic cracking, but also hydrogen gas is introduced um, in a process called hydrogenation, which we'll look at more in detail in another lesson. And um, no carbon is produced, so that keeps the waste down to a minimum. Hydrocracking is used to create things like jet fuel, 
um, diesel, something called uh, nap naphthalenes, which are like um, kind of like less refined, like it can be used to make kerosene, which used to be used in um, like lanterns and stuff like that. It can also be used to make plastics and um, natural gas as well, just the way catalytic cracking does. Okay, so in terms of what you guys should be knowing for testing, just make sure you know kind of the, like the general ideas, make sure that you know three, you know, that there's multiple types of cracking. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really say that you need to know a whole lot more about that, but make sure that you know these two points would for sure be really important to be aware of. Okay, over here we have a little bit of a rundown of how the, some of this um, catalytic cracking works. So you basically have the gas or oil that's coming in that has all kinds of different compounds in it. And what we want to do is break it down into desirable compounds. So we send it into this um, chamber basically where catalytic cracking occurs. So you have a catalyst in there that helps the reaction to happen. Um, now this catalyst does have a buildup of material on it after a certain amount of time. And so in order to be able to keep using it, we need to get that material off of it. So spent catalyst is cycled down through here into a different compartment where it can be heated to remove some of the um, impurities on it. And then it can be restored into the catalytic cracker to basically keep doing what it was doing. After you've gone through this cracking, um, process. You have all these different hydrocarbons and they're sent into something called a fractionator. So basically it this um, makes it so that the different compounds are separated by their density. So larger, heavier molecules are going to sink to the bottom and then you know, different weights are going to, like obviously the lightest ones are going to rise up to the top. So lighter oils, medium and heavy are going to separate out. And that way we can kind of get the different um, compounds that we want because they've been separated out by their densities. Okay, the next reaction we're going to look at is called reforming. So reforming, just like, again, the name implies, you're reforming something into a different shape, basically. So it's the opposite process of cracking. So instead of carbon-carbon bonds being broken the way they were in cracking, cracking um, they're being formed. Um, Again, catalysts and heat can be used as well as pressure, and those things are used to bond the carbons together. But what's basically happening here is you're converting straight chain alkanes into different shapes that you want. So it could be like a cyclic alkane, like we see here, where we have, um, let's see, hexane being converted into cyclohexane and hydrogen gets released as a product. The reason why hydrogen gets released in all of these reforming reactions is because we needed to free up bond space in order make, to make these carbons join up to form a ring, right? So these two carbons at each end need to each lose a hydrogen so that they can have a free spot to bond with each other to form this cyclic version. Um, you could also have branches being formed or um, aromatics in this case, like we see a cyclic alkane being converted into benzene. And so again, what we see is more bonds being formed between the carbons, which is going to kick off hydrogens. And so we see that happening here. Remember with benzene, we typically think of it as having three double bonds that alternate. And so that's going to leave us with um, basically three pairs of hydrogens that would have had to be kicked off in order to form those three double bonds. Okay. Um, so what? why would we want to do this? Cracking doesn't always produce molecules that are suitable for our needs. So for example, cracking could produce molecules with too few branches to act as a high quality gasoline, because basically with gasoline, what you want to be able to have happen is have a molecule that can break down really rapidly so that the energy can be produced in a straight chain. 
um, if I go back to this, in a straight chain like this, they can't access like these middle carbons unless the end carbons have been broken off, right? So in order to break these off to get energy, you would need to break off the end ones and then the next ones. Whereas if you have a whole bunch of chains, you can have carbons being broken off from all the chains as well as the central kind of parent chain all at once. So it kind of makes it more efficient in terms of gasoline. Um, so yeah, so we're basically just trying to make um, substances that we know we want um, based on their chemical properties is why we do reforming. Um, catalytic reforming, so just the way we looked at catalytic cracking, this is where you use a catalyst to encourage the reforming um, uh, reaction to happen. So this is the process of converting molecules in gasoline fraction right so we get those fractions produced by um, catalytic cracking and we want to convert them into aromatic gasoline molecules which have better burning pro properties than the original aliphatic molecules so basically they uh, um, sorry guys there's some noise outside I got distracted by um, so again like that branching property that I was talking about or, or aromatic uh, molecules as well. Um, like I said hydrogen is a byproduct. Something that's useful here is that because hydrogen is a byproduct it can actually then be recycled. The hydrogen that gets produced from this can be recycled and it can be used for hydro cracking. Right? So um, oh actually I guess we didn't really talk about it in here but with I guess I didn't really talk it in here but I did kind of mention a little bit here like with cracking that you could have when you break your single chain down into smaller ones you need to have hydrogens to replace the empty bond spots on the carbons so that's where this hydrogen that comes from reforming can then be recycled and used for that um, yeah another thing to just notice here is that with reforming you have the same number of carbons in the reactants and the products I mean I guess we always do because of um, <laughs> because of conservation of matter but the same number of carbons in the actual single product right so here if we have heptane with six carbons the product has all those six carbons still in it and the only other secondary product is the hydrogen that gets released from um, the rearrangement of the bonds okay so just the important reason why we point that out is because it shows that all we're doing is taking the original molecule and just making it into a different shape we're not actually adding things into the molecule um, okay another type of reaction we have is alkylation um, which is another way to improve the quality of gasoline or increase the branching of molecules it can also be called isomerization isomerization because it converts a molecule into a branched isomer okay so this is similar to um, the reforming that we just looked at so um, alkylation can be used to convert something like heptane into a more branched molecule here like isooctane I mentioned that that's a common component in gasoline and here you can see um, maybe I can illustrate for you guys a little bit better what I meant by the efficiency so if you think about when you're trying to burn heptane versus isooctane and you're trying to break these carbon bonds um, well maybe it doesn't totally make sense but basically in order to break like this carbon bond you first have to break this carbon bond before you can get to it whereas with isooctane so in heptane you can only take off one carbon two carbons at a time one at each end of the chain with isooctane any branch is a place where you can where like new reactions can kind of form and new bonds can form so basically all at once this carbon this carbon this carbon this carbon and that carbon could all be the bonds between them could all be broken 
So that's one, two, three, four, five spots where carbons can be taken off instead of only two. And so that in increases the uh, efficiency. This also talks a little bit about knocking, which occurs when combustion isn't um, in sync with the engine cycle, which causes lower engine efficiency and it can also damage the engine. So octane readings tell us how well fuel avoids the problem. And so if you have a higher value, that indicates nest less knocking and um, so that's kind of what you want to have for the best fuel for your vehicle. Um, so a little bit of a summary of everything we've looked at so far. We had catalytic cracking which takes larger molecules and makes them into smaller molecules and carbon can be left over as a byproduct. Um, we have hydrocracking which again takes larger molecules and makes them into smaller molecules, but a little bit of a difference here because here we had carbon as a product. In this case, we don't have a byproduct in hydrocracking, but we have another reactant that's needed, which is the hydrogen gas. Um, for catalytic reforming, we have aliphatic molecules, so usually like alkanes, and we're changing them into sometimes cyclics, or aromatic molecules, and hydrogen is a byproduct. So this is where we see that the byproduct of this reaction can be recycled to be used for, whoops, that's off the screen, sorry guys. The byproduct of this can be used to fuel this reaction. Um, and then last of all is alkylation or isomerization, where you take an aliphatic molecule again, and you make a more branched molecule, okay? So the only difference between these two is the a little bit of a product difference here because you have the hydrogen from this one and then um, the fact that the reforming is making cyclic and aromatic molecules and alkylation is just making a more branched molecule. Okay, last couple of things here is combustion. So complete combustion, you guys should be familiar with that from um, previous science classes. So basically you just have hydrocarbons burning in the presence of excess oxygen. This is the main important thing you need to be aware of for Chem 30 that we probably didn't really talk a lot about in Chem 20 or Science 10, is that you need to have an excess amount of oxygen um, available so that every single hydrocarbon can combust. So this produces carbon dioxide and water vapor always, right? So you know that reaction and it produces a very hot, bright flame. So you can see here, we have a burner and it has like a, a valve where you can control the airflow. If the airflow is completely open, we see this really bright, hot, blue flame happening, right? Um, if you guys want, there's a video here that shows three kind of like Christmas combustion tricks that you can do. And it explains like the combustion chemistry behind them. So the first demonstration shows um, like a complete combustion. And then later the, there's two other um, kind of tricks in there that you can do with candles that show uh, incomplete combustion. And so that's what we're going to look at next here, which is incomplete combustion, which is where you have a hydrocarbon burning in the presence of a limited amount of oxygen. And when that happens, so like here you can see the air hole for this same burner is not all the way open. And you see that this is more of the typical flame that we associate with like candles and stuff like that. Um, so it burns in the presence of a limited amount of oxygen. And when that happens, carbon monoxide is produced in addition to the complete combustion products. So carbon monoxide gets added in as well as the carbon dioxide and water and often we end up with soot, right? Which is why you see like the candle flame or the candle wick turning black. We have um, that carbon being produced. Also if you've ever noticed like if you have a candle burning close to a wall or whatever, if the flame gets too close to it, you'll see that there gets like black streaks on the wall from the smoke, even though usually we don't really see the candle smoke ourselves, but you can notice it if it's too close to objects where it ends up accumulating on there. So that's incomplete combustion when you still have soot, which is actually carbon. Okay, um, so this produces a cooler orange flame and a lot of times we end up with some polluting compounds when we think about incomplete combustion that happens in vehicles. So some of the things that get produced when you have incomplete combustion in a vehicle is um, 
nitrous oxides or nitrogen oxides, uh, carbon monoxide like we just mentioned, and then also the unburnt hydrocarbons, which is kind of a variation on just having the carbon. And so in order to reduce these polluting compounds, um, because like nitrogen oxides uh, actually end up creating they combine with, um, let me think about what that is. They combine with other hydrocarbons to create um, a type of ozone that is basically responsible for smog and also is like really bad for creating respiratory problems, as well as the fact that nitrogen oxides can combine with water in the air to form acids which result in acid deposition which is not good um, so like acid rain and stuff like that carbon monoxide as you know it's very dangerous to have a vehicle running in a closed area and the reason for that is because carbon monoxide gets produced and carbon monoxide is an odorless colorless gas so humans can't detect it but basically what it does is it goes into your blood cells that are trying to carry oxygen and it's actually more efficiently able to bond to your blood cells than oxygen so it kind of kicks them off but it doesn't feed your cells oxygen the way that they need it to so it actually ends up killing you. Um, yeah, and then we have the unburnt hydrocarbons. So basically, in order to reduce these compounds, we have something called a catalytic converter in a vehicle. And this is made out of different types of metals that basically end up um, allowing a bunch of reactions to happen that convert the nitrogen oxides into just nitrogen gas. Um, and then we end up with, instead of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, we end up with carbon dioxide and water. Um, carbon dioxide still problematic because um, it's a greenhouse gas, but at least it's not killing us as fast as carbon monoxide. And then um, water, of course, is totally fine. So I think that's everything we need to know from there. Oh, just be aware that you don't have to predict the products for an incomplete combustion in Chem 30. So you don't have to predict like the balanced ratio of them, but you should be aware that um, that you that carbon monoxide and carbon will be there in addition to um, regular water and carbon dioxide. Okay. All right, so um, that's everything for the reactions we're going to look at today. You guys do have some practice problems to try. So if you um, want to see how to solve those, you can stick with the video, but make sure that you pause the video first and try them on your own um, to see if you can get them and then just watch this component if you are not sure, like if you couldn't get the right answer or are not sure why that answer was the right answer. Um, and then you also have some practice problems from the textbook. There's also some interesting stuff in here about um, like combustion, which also includes like the information about how nitrogen dioxide combines with hydrocarbons to form ozone, um, which we just saw in the incomplete combustion. Um, also as well, like the different types of like flaming versus smoldering. You can see in here what we were talking about with some of the differences in um, products there. Um, some of the health um, concerns that arise with wildfires and then also some of the different stages of what's breaking down according to the temperature of combustion that's happening. So um, just some interesting stuff. Next time we're going to look at organic halides and alcohols. Um, just reactions that happen with those. Okay, so I will see you in that lesson unless you want to see these practice questions. All right, so practice number one, an example of hydrocarbon reforming is shown by equation. So we want to look at these equations and see if we can find hydrocarbon reforming. So remember with reforming, we're seeing the transformation of um, a hydrocarbon into um, a cyclic or aromatic hydrocarbon um, and then we see hydrogen produced as a product so pretty obvious that like this one is the one with hydrogen as a product in this one here let's just really quickly go through these though because you know with a question on these types you could have looked at any one of these um, so we have this first one here we have a large hydrocarbon being combined with hydrogen to form another large hydrocarbon, right, which seems kind of weird. Um, 
but basically what's happening here is that we have hydrogen being added in to break if you look at what's changing here it's the number of hydrogens on this um, hydrocarbon and if we have more hydrogens it means we're moving to a more saturated compound so we're actually going from something like an alkene maybe to an alkane we did not learn that today um, we'll learn that in a future lesson uh, with this one we have a hydrocarbon and an, a halogen being added right and then we see a hydrocarbon still the same number C6 but less hydrogens and we've had chlorines replace right and then we have hydrochloric acid as a byproduct there so this is um, where we have an alkane or an alkene or whatever changing into um, an organic halide again we did not learn that today so you, that one would not be correct with this one we have a hydrocarbon and heat going to make two smaller hydrocarbons we did learn about that today so if you can think of it what would that be called it would be called cracking and then in this last one we have two forms of it looks like pentane um, and heat is being added and then we end up with C10H22 and hydrogen gas so with this what we end up with is um, two smaller molecules combining to form a larger molecule now we didn't really talk about this too much with our reforming um, but it, you can use two smaller molecules we kind of just talked about one molecule um, linking up at the ends to form a cyclic but technically you can have two ones joining together to form a cyclic and hydrogen at the end so this one is our best option for that okay um, practice number two the process in which large organic molecules are broken down into smaller molecules to increase the yield of gasoline so larger into smaller is always cracking okay all right, that's everything, and next time I will see you in organic halide and alcohol reactions. So I'll see you then.